Hi guys, uh, it's Andreas Sonic Mainliner with another Final Finds video. It's been a month since my last update and basically I haven't been buying that much, uh, you know, music. I've been listening to a lot of music, but I haven't been buying because, well, I need to balance my, uh, my financials basically. But I did buy some and I'm going to be sharing those with you and I'm going to be, because, you know, the volume is not huge, it's like five albums, um, I'm probably going to be you know, talking a little bit more about them rather than just showing how we go, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, well, play in the background. You've seen this. I mean, I've shown it like a long time ago. Uh, the Epic, obviously, I have the vinyl box set as well, but, you know, since I'm making a video, I think it's much easier to put a CD on and let it play. This is uh, the second volume, uh, The Glorious Tale, so, yeah. That's what's playing in the background, if you're curious. So, in the last uh, Vinyl Update video, I mentioned that I had ordered uh, an album uh, that hadn't come yet, and uh, this is it. So, this is Cubist Blues, and it's Alex Chilton, Alan Vega from uh, Suicide, Alex Chilton from uh, Big Star, and uh, Ben Vaughn, whom I'm, I'm not very familiar with. I don't know if you know him. Maybe he was in a band, I, I don't know, I haven't done much research. Anyway, I saw this album uh, going to Rough Trade, uh, about like, I don't know, two months ago. And I um, saw it, and I like the cover, so you know, that's, that's how you start. It's like, uh, alright, that looks interesting. Then I saw the names of the people playing, Alex Chilton and uh, Alan Vega. Obviously I was more drawn to Alan Vega. And I hadn't seen this before. It was like the first time that I've seen it. I had no idea what it was. And in, to my mind, when you see something like this, and it's a collaboration, and you've never seen it before, it can be either very good or a huge turd. So um, given the price that they had it on Rough Trade, because they do mark things up, because they're a physical store and whatnot, which you know, I get, and sometimes I even support uh, by paying that premium, but not during this time. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I saw it, and it was like, what, 28 pounds or 27 pounds or something like that. And I was, you know what, this is too risky, I think, for me to actually, you know, invest in buying this without knowing what it is. In previous times I would have picked it up anyway because you know it sort of looks interesting also uh, I failed to mention that this is a light in the attic ratio double LP so I went back home uh, I found it on Spotify I gave it a listen and uh, it was actually good enough to warrant me buying it um, yeah it's it's a very interesting uh, collaboration so what happened in 1994 these four three guys four guys uh, three guys just uh, went on set an impromptu set so everything that you hear is like a one take kind of thing and it works really 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 well uh, the, the title is cubist blues and I think that this sort of describes the music very well so you get very <laughs> Because if you think about it, if you bring three Western musicians on a set to play, you know, without having played before, uh, without any plan or anything, they're going to play the blues, basically. And Alex Chilton would definitely be the bluesy kind of guy. So what you have is blues layered with Alan Vega's surreal and monotone kind of delivery and you know suicide sort of uh, note I mean he he adds this kind of I don't know uh, decadence in anything that he does which makes it really interesting I mean you know he could play with I don't know the <laughs> the royal uh, orchestra or whatever and it would sound like dodgy <laughs> if you know what I mean so yeah it is very interesting sounding I mean, the opening track is just stunning. However, there is there is a little bit of an issue with this album. If you know, if I have to be honest, and I will not be the type of like, oh yeah, this is amazing. I have it. You should buy it. You know, buy it because I have it. <laughs> no, no, I won't. I won't be doing that. What, what I'm gonna say is that because of 
the fact that basically these guys just went on a stage and played. And as I said, they used the blues as a base uh, to, you know, build um, music. Um, is that a lot of times it does sound samey, which you cannot really sort of accuse them of it because they never played before. I don't think that it was a specific plan. And for that, for the fact that it was impromptu and it was like, you know, on the spot and whatnot, then, you know, it's really good. It does have that shortcoming. I think that if they had further sessions, it could have evolved a lot and there could be a lot more interesting things, but they never came back together to play again. And it's a shame, I think. And so, you know, this album will, if I were to give a score, I wouldn't give him, give it a nine. I would give it a seven. Having said that, it is quite good. So, you know, check it out. You know, it's, it's available online for your listening pleasure. So it's easy. Uh, next up, <clears throat> Um, where should I go? Yeah, well, I don't know. All right, yeah, well, a hotly anticipated reissue. Um, this is an album that I have been waiting for for around, I don't know, maybe 20 years. I am old enough to, to, to have been looking for this uh, for 20 years. So this is uh, this Heat's uh, Deceit. This is an album that came out, sorry about the glare. This is an album that came out originally in 1981 on Rough Trade Recordings. Uh, Rough, Rough Trade Recordings? No, it's just Rough Trade Records. Sorry, I don't know where the recordings came. So, yeah, 1981. And uh, I, as I said, I've been looking for a copy, a decent copy that is not too expensive for around 20 years. And uh, the first time I saw it, it was at a friend's house. Um, he, I was immediately captured by the cover. I mean, you know. There's a pattern here, isn't there? It's like Cubist Blues. Oh, I like the cover. I will, I will check that out. Same thing here. So uh, this heat, I saw the cover and I was sort of, I was confused. Uh, I mean, what, what kind of music is this? this what, what, what kind of things are these guys saying? Because the cover does look like a hardcore punk, crust punk, I don't know, something like metal-oid music, but it's not, obviously 1981. It's a classic post-punk album. Some people consider it a masterpiece. And, uh, well, I think that what, what I can say about this, uh, this album is that, as I said, it was, I was mesmerized by it. I try to understand it, and it's the kind of album that sort of draws me in to sort of figure it out. And if you listen to the music, it is, it is very disturbing. It's very unsettling, not disturbing, unsettling kind of music. It is the kind of music that sort of would fit the, the soundtrack to <clears throat> the post-apocalypse. It's not the apocalypse. The apocalypse needs to be like, you know, grand and epic and like menacing and whatnot. No, no, no. This is like, this is very lamentful. It feels like you're, you're shifting through the rubble of a, you know, once great civilization that got destroyed by its own stupidity, really. And there are moments here that do remind you that it is punk, but there are also moments that are like very sort of, it feels like, you know, the environment is falling apart. Um, I, I don't know if I can, I am describing this correctly and if I'm conveying, you know, the, the feel of this album, you know, in a good enough manner. And there are songs that are like, you know, as I said, they can catch you like that, like uh, SPQR, uh, which stands for Senadus Popula Populaski uh, Romanus, uh, the Senate and the people of Rome. And it's, it's a stunner so, uh, song. And then there is A New Kind of Water and uh, Makeshift Swahili. I mean, the titles are like, you know, what the hell are they talking about? I mean, you know, the music is menacing, the titles are bizarre, the lyrics are bizarre. It's like, there's something wrong in the world and they know and they're telling me, but I don't understand. <laughs> that's, that's my feeling. That's a feeling I get when I listen to this album. And... Um, 
it is a hard album to get into. Some people, I will not claim that I will be like, yeah, this is a masterpiece and I listen to it all the time and I'm really cool and if you don't get it, you're idiots. I have it, you should buy it as well, <laughs> kind of thing. No, uh, I, uh, it, it's more like, um, it's a kind of album that is so intriguing that I come back to it again and again because I know there is something in there that I need to understand. I don't claim to get it and there are albums like this that I do come back to again and again because I know there is that there is something artistic and beyond what my understanding is that I will one day capture and it's like albums like uh, for example 20 Just, Just Fine Greats, Spiderland from Slint. These are albums that I don't necessarily think that are like you know some people consider them masterpieces I consider them essentials for a collection and worth the time spent listening to them because there are things that you can get. If you reach the point where you can actually enjoy it and just play all, all day long, good for you. I'm not one of those people. So anyway, this hit, this hit. Out on Light in the Attic, brilliant reissue, gatefold which I will not show because I still have it in the shrink wrap because I am cuckoo and uh, it has a printed inner sleeve, well, not printed inner sleeve, sorry, what am I talking about? It has a printed uh, a booklet here with, um, with information and blah, 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 blah. And there's also the EP, there's a, an EP and another LP, the first LP. This is the second LP, I think. But I won't get these because, you know, I don't want to spend the money right now and because I have the CD box set out of cold storage which has all of it plus one unreleased live or something like that. So that's uh, this heat. Uh, then uh, on we go to an album that, well, a band that I, I knew about uh, for a while but I never really got into. So a friend of mine uh, was very much very keen on them and he has uh, lent, he lent me some CDs he had. I listened to them but you know it's, it's alright but not the kind of music I really like. I'm talking about Woven Hand and I've, uh, I've known them since like what 2005 and 2006. One of their albums came up in like the top 100 list for Pitchfork so I downloaded it. Yes. I downloaded it. Shame on me, I know. But I redeemed myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was like, all right, yeah, this is good. But I forgot about it. And uh, Woven Hand is the... Uh, the uh, uh, sorry, uh, what's his name? Steven Taylor? Is it Steven Taylor? No. Oh, I'm terrible with names, guys. I'm terrible. I want to say Steven Taylor. Uh, Steven Taylor's uh, personal sort of uh, project uh, after he left 16 horse, Horsepower uh, back in the early 2000. Another band that some people revere and alternative country band that people really like. And uh, I don't know. Anyway, Woven Hand, I knew them. I've listened to the music. I wasn't really, you know, impressed. But then I listened to this. And the reason, and the way that I've, discovered it is through Spotify. Spotify has a function called discovery. So uh, every Monday they create a playlist based on what you listen to. And, you know, they try to, you know, uh, show you some new stuff basically. So I was listening to that, uh, to that playlist and then this song came along, which is My Russia. So, and I was, I stopped and paid attention really. Then um, I've, after the song ended, I clicked on Woven Hand, went on to the album, and I started listening to the album. And then I listened to it again, and again, and again. And um, yeah. So in the end, I, I started trying to find out if there is, you know, a record out for this. Originally, it came out on CD in 2001, I want to say, 2002. In 2002, it was CD only, 
and this is a 2015 reissue from a Spanish label called Bang Records, which is very decent. I mean, it sounds great, um, quite present and all that. So, you know, I found it for a good price and I bought it. Now, musically, it's very, it's uh, mostly acoustic uh, instruments, um, anything from cellos to guitars, bass, organ, banjo, because it is alternative country and I think that the title alternative country does not do it justice. There is the country element where you get some instrumentation from country music. Um, there is also the kind of feel that you get from the mu <laughs> This is a sort of music that I think that has deep roots in the American traditional gospel and blues kind of music and not blues but folk music but folk that is that is the word so deep roots in folk music but very modern so it is and as i said alternative country doesn't do it justice i mean does alternative you know indie rock or alternative rock do justice to nick cave and the bad seeds no it doesn't so yeah, it's as close as you can really sort of put your finger at it. And the, the music is really well orchestrated. The choruses are just elevate the songs amazingly. There is a cover of um, Ain't No Sunshine, uh, which is starting, starts the second side, which is brilliant. It's, it is more countries, probably the, the the folkier or countryer kind of uh, song in here, and it's an amazing album. Do listen to My Russia. Uh, don't don't skip. Just let it play for two minutes. If it doesn't do it for you, then just forget about it. It's just, yeah, don't 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 bother. But don't don't forget about it. Bookmark it and let it play at some later point. I'm pretty sure that you will find it, you will probably get uh, the same feeling I got. It was like, ooh, what's that? <laughs> so yeah, Woven Hand, first album, highly recommended. If I were to give a score, I would give a nine. This is, you know, definitely one to check out. Now, uh, metal. Yes, there has to be some uh, metal. You have to put some metal in your life. Now, I know that, you know, you might not, you might start, you know, you might skip immediately. It's like, oh, metal, well, well, I'm, I don't care about metal. But, you know, there are people out there that might be interested in this. Uh, people that, you know, enjoy Liturgy or uh, Deaf Heaven. Two bands that I honestly don't fancy that much, to be honest. But this is sort of like the more metal kind of approach to Anyway, so the band is this one. So this is called Black Celice. Uh, this is the name of the band. It's a one-man black metal band from Portugal, of all places. Uh, this is a limited edition, uh, 26, as you can see, out of 300. This is the first pressing. I think they have three pressings. Um, one is black, which is this one, the first one, and then there's a blue one, and there's another one. I have a black one, so yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter had the option to get the, the you know the second press but I was like you know what screw it it was like a few pounds more so I, I got the original one so yeah this is uh, an album that came out in 2015 it's called mysteries uh, and it has been reviewed by pitchfork and I was introduced to this album through uh, Mike C towns uh, channel who is sort of VC but not really VC so he knows some people in the VC he watches some of them but not really and I think that his channel is way too big to be VC because to have a VC channel you need to have like you know maximum of 500 <laughs> subscribers or a thousand maybe you know it's if, if you're more than that then it's not really VC because you get too many comments you cannot really you know manage it anyway yeah, and, um, you know, I checked it out. Uh, he said, oh, I, I was really bothered by it, but and whatnot. 
but and this is black metal obviously this so it's the usual kind of fare up to one point of black metal where you get like really poor production that creates that kind of <clears throat> atmosphere and texture that you know black metal is famous for if you like but what really captured me were the vocals so basically I've been you know I've been a metalhead when, when I started listening to music seriously and uh, I've sort of uh, followed the progression of how vocals were utilized in metal so you know back in the 70s it was like the music and the vocals would sort of uh, go together if you like in fact I think that the music was there to sort of put more emphasis on the vocals. Then we got sort of got to the 80s, early 80s, where the, the music and the vocals sort of blended together so that they can create one stream of music, if you like. And then thrash metal came in and then music was really fast and then vocals were really fast. So you had like, you know, Slayer like uh, singing like, it's not that mention of the British will never know the Winston such a violent so powerful. No. <laughs> Anyway, really fast lyrics like in Hella Waits or I don't know, Morbid Angel that were like, you know, a word a second, two words a second potentially. And then that sort of decoupled as music became state fast and then lyrics sort of could actually be discernible uh, through the listening of the album. And then as we come to this sort of day and age of black metal you get like really long songs 10-15 minutes and with three lines of lyrics and vocals almost throughout so it's really drawn out I mean give you an example I was uh, I was listening to Leviathan right so this one so it has a lyric sheet and I wanted to reminisce from my days when I was like a teenager and I would like, you know, listen to metal albums and I would l read the lyrics and listen to the record and all that. Uh, and I tried to follow the lyrics and I couldn't. There was no way. It was like way too drawn out. I would, I, I would lose concentration. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And I was thinking, what the hell, man? I mean, you know, do they just sprinkle, you know, lyric, you know, vocals on top, I mean, what's the point? And that's what he's doing. He's like taking out the, completely that, this element of vocals. It's, the vocals are not really vocals. There's, I don't think that there are any lyrics as such. Uh, it's sort of, they are so distorted and so drawn out. It sounds like a whale. It sounds like, uh, you know, the wind through, you know, the ruins of ancient castles or something like that. And it feels like, you know, it's, it's like a layer of mist, if you like, on top of the music, which is brilliant. It is, it is black metal, but it has those uh, post-rock elements of guitar work that sort of... Um, I don't know how you call the, the guitar picking technique that, you know, it's like uh, very constantly hidden one note and then it sort of progresses and things like that, which make it very post-rockish or post -rockish. and the, the, the vocals just add a layer on top of it, uh, of that atmosphere and it's, it works really well. It's, it's really, really good. I would give this a nine as well. So, you know, I if you have like you know an interest in this kind of stuff i recommend that you check it out that's all i'm saying and finally an album that uh, i was introduced to through the vc uh, again uh, and i want to say that the person that showed it is the metal theologian but i'm not entirely sure anyway if it was you kudos to you if it wasn't you i love you man keep it up so Min Bu, uh, this is a um, reissue from 2008. The Min Bu were three guys. I don't think that they did anything other than this album. It's Norwegian, free jazz essentially. And what you get is six songs, uh, two of which are amazing, amazing jams. Uh, it's uh, basically bass, guitar, um, 
saxophone, the guitarist also doubles as a saxophonist, and drums. And there are songs that are improvised, like, you know, it's sort of a little bit all over the place and I will not claim to know, you know, uh, I, or get it necessarily, but I do get the whole record as a whole. And the jams are just amazing. If they could just extend those jams to 20 minutes and cover one side, jam one, side two, jam two, it would be like a 10. Um, it's not. Uh, it does have those uh, improvised tracks, which may work for you or may not work for you. So I will give it a seven. I'm scoring albums today. I don't know why I'm doing that. So yeah, that's that's all I have to say. It's already 25 minutes. I, I just showed five fucking albums. So I think I should shut up. Ming Bu. So yeah, what's the name? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, these are the names of those guys. I, I don't know their backstory or if they've done something else. I haven't checked it to be honest, but yeah. So yeah, I found this because I was, um, I had it saved in a Spotify playlist. I played it again. I was like, oh, this is really good. I checked on uh, Discogs and it was like 30 pounds plus to get this reissue. Originals, just forget about it. And I found a copy for 20 pounds on Amazon. So I was like, you know what? If I don't buy it now, uh, probably it would be like, you know, beyond my reach. And if I don't like it, I can still sell it. So I got it. So anyway, that's the end of the video. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Um, you know, uh, you can uh, leave a comment uh, if you want. I always respond. You know, it can be like, you know, uh, whatever, uh, a slur, <laughs> you know, bad language, whatever you want to say, uh, you know, feel free. I always respond, as I said. Uh, like the video uh, if you like it, dislike it if you disliked it. Um, you can uh, subscribe to this channel if this is the kind of thing you're into or you know if you want to see more of it. And um, unsubscribe if you think this is a load of crap and I wasted your time and you hate me. I hate you back for it. <laughs> anyway, so until next time, um, see you guys around.